All right, we're live, cool. Um, hey everyone, I'm Elisa Jansen Jones, and with me today is Aaron Cole Steele. Um, we are from Conselmer, and so happy to be able to present for the LMEA Ready, Set, Go conference. We're so excited to have you with us, and we are going to be talking about a real hot button issue today, which is closing the gap with your students. Not only the, the knowledge gap, though we will address that, but also how do we get them re-engaged in our programs and reactivated in the way that will serve them and serve our programs for a long time to come. So I'm going to start by just a quick introduction. Uh, my current role at Con Selmer is the Senior Product Manager for all things digital. So if it's done online or a digital product, it probably falls under me and that allows me to do what I really enjoy, which is professional development for music educators. I am an experienced K-8 music educator, which means I've taught elementary, band, choir, and orchestra, and jazz band, so I've kind of run the whole gambit, even a ukulele ensemble. Um, I'm currently a community band director, so I'm very passionate about lifelong learning, as you probably guessed. Um, so in addition to my music education degree and knowledge, I also have a Master of Business Administration. So I often talk about how music business can support uh, our teaching and learning opportunities as well. And I'm currently working on my Doctor of Education in Instructional Design. And many of you probably know me as well as the co-founder of the Music Educators Creating Online Learning Facebook group, or maybe from my podcast, the Music Ed Mentor Podcast. All right, kick it to Erin. Hi, everybody. My name is Erin Cole Steele, and my current role with Con Selmer is a director of educational programs. I'm also a senior educational clinician for the company as well. Um, Hal Leonard, educational clinician and essential elements contributing editor. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the teaching music through performance books. I've had the pleasure of being a contributed author for three editions of that, as well as rehearsing the middle school band. And I've been teaching for 20 six uh, years. So really my passion is middle school. And it's so funny because I never thought I would say that. <laughs> my dad is a retired high school band director. I always wanted to be a high school band director. So, you know, I, I that was my aspiration. But the very first job that came open where in the county I wanted to teach in was middle school. So I took it, fell in love with it. And that is now kind of my thing. And just a little bit about where I taught. Tap Middle School is in the Cobb County School District of Georgia. It's a sixth through eighth grade traditional model middle school, Title I school, little tiny town, Powder Springs, Georgia. Uh, we had 770 students in the, in the school, between 450 to 500 every year in, in the BAM program. So a large portion of the school was involved in our program. 70% uh, free and reduced lunch, lunch, 65% economically disadvantaged, but 100% feeder to McEachern High School. The reason I say that, at least in our district, that's not a common thing for 100% of that middle school to go to one high school, which was awesome. Um, and then we typically had 85 to 90% of our eighth grade class continue in high school band. We actually so share this. Yeah, share go ahead. That, that, well, I was going to say, we actually share that background of having a band director dad. So I know. I was just about to say that. We are both <laughs> survivors. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's actually a, it was a great thing. Um, and I'm sure it had everything to do with why both of us continued on in music education ourselves, which, you know, actually brings me to this next slide is why do we do what we do? Well, obviously, we were impacted by our fathers being band directors, and we knew that's what we wanted to do. But you think about, you go back to when you were in band or you know choir or orchestra or whatever you were passionate about in your music experience, and you probably lived in that room, right? You always wanted to run down to the, your choir room or your band room and your directors were kicking you out because that's your safe place. That was your happy place. That's where you wanted to be. And I think we have to keep in mind and it's been a very difficult year and a half, but we have to go back to why do we do what we do? We want to create memorable experiences for our students. We want to, to have a safe and positive learning environment for them. And more than anything, create a lifelong love of music, regardless of whether or not they go on, you know, in college to major in music or even participate in music. We want them to love it. Yeah, the best advice I ever got from a principal when I asked him, what do you want me to teach the students? And he said, 
I want them to love music. That is, that is the number one goal always. Bingo. And, you know, right now, I think we have to, it's a bit of a paradigm shift on how we're going to get there. We may not be getting there the same way, but the goal is the same. And that's why I have this slide up here. We still want our students to be successful. We still want to have large programs. We want to have all those things happening, but we have to wrap our head around how are we going to do that now? This past year has been so difficult. And now what in the world is going to happen even these next few months with the Delta variant? and everything else popping up, we might have to wrap our head around that. Anything else, Elisa, from you? <laughs> no, just, I mean, when I think of a paradigm shift, I, I remember when we all suddenly had to go into remote learning. But keep in mind, remote learning is not anything new. It's been going on for, for thousands of years. Every time you've read a book and learned from it, that's remote learning. Anytime you, you watched a Dr. Tim video when you were in high school on VHS, that was remote learning. So just keep in mind, you can still do some really effective learning and teaching no matter what the situation happens to be. Absolutely. So today we're going to talk about recruitment and retention. I, you know, I thought about closing the gap. Number one thing that came to my mind was, well, ha hang on, we still got to get our students in the program and we got to keep the ones that we had still engaged and wanting to be in our program. Uh, learning loss, which, you know, I'm, I'm going to get to this in a little bit. I can't stand learning loss. We didn't really lose it. We just got to regain that may have been delayed a bit. And we'll get to that in a little bit as well. And more than anything, we want to provide you with a lot of resources that you can take away in your toolkit. Um, but one thing I do want to tell you, we have a handout that has a lot of resources in there, some of which we're not even going to have time to get to today. So we're going to give those to you in that handout. But if you ever have any questions about anything else that's in there, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. You're going to get our emails at the end. And it's also in the handout as well. All right, let's 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 jump in. So recruitment and retention. Boy, I love this topic. I get all fired up about this and I could do an entire session just on this. So we have a lot to get to today <laughs> regarding recruitment and retention. But let's start off by talking about why do students join? Think about that. And again, it's coming back to thinking about why did you join? And it's to be part of something that is successful but really social, right? It's an instant group of friends and they just, the students just wanna have fun. They wanna be part of something where their friends are and they know they're gonna have a good time. And the biggest part of that is you and your personality. Students join because of you, because they learn about you, they learn to get to know your personality and they wanna be part of that program. Right now, I think we have to think differently, though, about how we go about this, right? We have to be very creative about our recruitment process and be open-minded to doing things that are maybe not the same way you've done it in the past, and that's okay. And we have to be open-minded, too. I put re-recruit because you may have to re-recruit. There may be a whole year of students where you didn't get as many as you're used to getting, and that's okay too, but you gotta figure out how you're gonna get them now, okay? Rallying the troops, which we're gonna get to in a little bit too, and then to be honest with you, your students just wanna be back in person. So that's to your benefit, and the part where I say it's not a one size fits all, we know that, okay? It's not even the same from one state to the next. It's not the same from one district to the next or in Louisiana, one parish to the next, right? So, um, Elisa, do you want to elaborate on any of those things I just talked about? No, just totally agree. Just keep in mind, too, if you're an elementary teacher or if you're a middle school teacher and your class is compulsory, you still have to recruit them in, in a very spiritual kind of way to music. Because if you can get them to buy in and have fun and, and be engaged, it's going to make your classroom management a breeze. Bingo. So let's talk about reevaluating. So 
first off, you got to reevaluate maybe even what you did two years ago, figure out what worked and what didn't work, and definitely what happened last year. And it might be one of those things, okay, well, we weren't able to do what we did two years ago. So now this past year, it, it was crazy. We need to completely figure out what we're going to do now this coming year to recruit our students. And what has worked? Maybe you found out some things this past year you had never tried before because you had to, but it actually worked and you want to keep those things. And maybe find out from others what worked for them, you know, really just network with people and find out, hey, what are you doing this year to make sure you're getting the, the amount of students you need to or re-recruit, like I said, students that you may not have gotten last year. So this is all about being a problem solver and figuring out solutions. So have solutions ready. The reason I say that is especially with your administration, don't wait for them to come to you and say, how are you going to do this? Already have a plan in place for how you're going to recruit your students this year. And again, talk to other directors. But the biggest thing is just be proactive and be that answer person for your building and stay positive no matter what. You got this. Elisa, anything? No, just just reiterate the stay positive because the second that you start to sound like you're complaining or you're creating the problems or or any time that, that that negativity can come across. So just try and really spin everything. So even though it is challenging, we don't say it's a problem, it's a challenge. And it's a positive opportunity for us to learn and grow and reiterate. So just stay positive and that will always get people on your team. 100%. And it's all about communication. And I feel like it's, you know, three pronged, meaning there's three different parts to this and then three prongs for each of those. So you're talking about at the district level, what are the parameters you're working with at the district level to the administration, to you as the director? One of the biggest parts of communication that I think it's so vital to recruitment and retention from elementary all the way through high school is the communication between all three buildings, from the elementary to the middle school director to the high school director and working cohesively. It has to be a team effort. Um, and then the obvious one, the director and your communication to the parents and the students, which we're gonna dive into a little bit deeper here in just a minute. So that all comes down to collaboration. So obviously the collaboration with your administration, that to me also includes counselors, because a lot of times in your building, the counselors are the ones in charge of scheduling. I will say that I was very proactive and it was not an easy job, but I offered to do scheduling in my building. It was a headache but a blessing at the same time, if you know what I mean, because I had complete control over my own students at what was happening with that. So if you have it in you, you know, serve on that scheduling committee or even just take it over if you can. Um, the elementary middle school feeder process, um, it kind of depends, you know, if you're recruiting from your elementary or if right now we're talking even some high school directors out there, communicating with your middle school director, okay? And again, it's that collaboration between all of you. And working together as a department, I mean, as a music department, or if you have a connections team in your building, which includes art, maybe technology, drama, all those teachers working together to make sure you're getting students in the right place. That is also not competing for students. So if you're lucky enough in your building to have orchestra, choir, band, just making sure you're working together collaboratively and not fighting for students. I was very fortunate where I taught, we had a fabulous relationship between all three of us, choir, band, and orchestra. And we really just wanted to make sure students were getting to the place that they were happy. They were playing the instrument they wanted to or were in choir. Elisa, do you have any experience with that as well? Yeah, just a ton. I mean, not not only everything that, that you just said, but I think also consider having a class that that, you know, anybody can join at any skill level. So that there's, you're breaking down that barrier of, you know, I haven't played trumpet before or I haven't ever sang before. So creating those opportunities as well, but absolutely getting them involved. I have a dream that one day we'll have enough music class options as we have sports options for people. 
you know, and don't be mad at me when I say this, but I, I'll be honest with you. I worked real hard to make this happen in our building. We allowed students to sign up for two music classes. That was their two connections classes. Now That's I'm saying awesome. this only because I play flute and cello. So I grew up being able to do that. So I fought hard for it, but you know, it made it easier. But then of course you have the kids that want to take all three. Or can I be in choir, band, and orchestra? Well, actually no. <laughs> <laughs> Two is enough. But yeah, if you can even work that out, you know, and you're scheduling, that would be awesome, too. Uh, I put work with boosters. I think it's great to have the collaboration with your high school booster program with your feeder middle school parents and getting them into the fold with your booster program before they are even in their students or their children are in high school, because if you can get the parents to buy in, that retention from middle school to high school is going to be much higher because those parents are like, oh, no, you're staying in this program because they've already been involved with the booster program. And then work with other teachers in your school outside of maybe the connections and the fine arts department. You know, get out of your little bubble <laughs> and go meet those other the math teachers, the you know, reading teachers, the other teachers in your school so that there is just a healthy collaborative effort school wide for your programs. And then the obvious one, reach out to your local music stores, especially now. You know, see if you can get them out to help with, you know, if you're doing instrument testings or just signups or however you're going about that process, they would be more than happy to come out there and help you. All right, so obviously we just talked about establishing that great relationship, but now we're gonna get into the weeds a little bit. You need to be visible in those elementary schools or if you're a high school director in those middle schools and those kids need to know who you are long before they're signing up. A bad sign is if the high school director comes over in the spring and the eighth graders go, who's that? Not a good thing, right? It just needs to be part of the staff. We're all working together from the very beginning, and they're going to be so much more comfortable crossing that bridge and going into, you know, whether it be high school or even from elementary into middle school. So invite those teachers to come over often and work with your students. Guests conduct on a concert. Perform for those students often. We always, and Elise, I'm sure you probably did something similar, so feel free to jump in. But we would have our chamber ensembles go over to the, the elementary school at Christmas time. We would bring our flute ensemble. We just walk around in the hallways during class changes playing Christmas carols. We would have the drum line over there in the spring out by the buses playing for them. Just being visible, but letting those kids see other students perform. Do you want to share anything you did that was similar to that? Yeah, we, we did Christmas caroling um, for our choir. We didn't just go out to other schools and do it with a small group. We did it within the school as well so that everybody had a little more visibility. Because especially with choir, you can, you can bring kids in um, at almost any skill level. So I know choir teachers are like, no, -uh. okay. You maybe can. Um, I think that's pretty much, but yeah. Okay. So performing for element and I can, we can totally edit by the way. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> um, send communication. Oh, right, right, right. So also all of the same stuff can be done in person or virtually or both. So don't be afraid to make like a little introduction video for your elementary or your middle school teachers to be able to share out. Um, don't be afraid to reach out via email, any way that you can get in front of them. It's going to help build that relationship. Yeah, we're going to talk even more detail about that in just a second. Um, so now we're talking about promoting. That's when you put your salesman cap on, right? And you have to be a salesman for your program, saleswoman. Um, so talk about your program accolades, the trips you take, the events you participate in. Trips are always a good one. You know, you can you can get students, oh, what, you're kidding? We're going to Disney World? You know, really, really play that stuff up. Achievement data saying, you know, did you know that the last five valedictorians of the high school were also in band or choir or orchestra? You know, all those kinds of things. Talk about when you get the opportunity to stand in front of the parents, which I hope you do, because that's a really great way of, again, if you can get those parents to buy in. Uh, the achievement data there. Talk about how students are able to participate in other activities outside of band, orchestra, and choir. And here's a big one. How it's a family. We are a community. 
and we want you to be part of our group. We're good for you, and we want you to be part of this because you're good for us. And really promote that healthy, supportive atmosphere. Okay, and let's just be real. Parents want their children to be part of something that's successful. They want their kids to be happy. They want their kids to be in something that they know they're going to flourish, right? And then obviously, and I'm going to let Elisa take this one, but you got to look professional when you're doing your <laughs> your website and everything else. Go ahead, Elisa. Yeah, there's there's enough free and cheap tools out there for you to have a logo, a set of colors that you always use, like two fonts. Just have a really good, solid branding guide and do everything that's those same colors, those same fonts. And it's just going to give you this great professional look and feel. And everybody loves swag, right? Everybody loves to wear their logo, their, their community, their, their spirit on their sleeve. And I want to go back also to the, the trips and events. Yeah. I got kids excited to do band just for the prospect of going to one festival. It doesn't have to be like a huge trip or those those elementary and middle school recruiting trips. You know, every year, hey, if you're in the top band, you got to go to the elementary schools and do the demo concerts. And that was carrot enough. Yeah, totally. And with the swag, you know, we always had our band t-shirt Fridays. And actually, it wasn't just the band. All three programs, it was band, orchestra, and choir. And what was awesome about it is 90% of our school was in band, orchestra, or choir. So on Fridays, it was incredible to see all the kids at that school that had their music department shirts on. It was just awesome. And then I'm actually going to show you something. I know the quality of these pictures aren't the best, but you get the gist. Uh, the bottom picture there is on our spring instrument fitting night. But the reason I put that up there is look at the top picture. If you can really look in close, you'll notice that even in the spring, after we sign those students up, they get to get their band t-shirts at night. Do you know how cool those kids think they are when they're in fifth grade? in the spring walking around their elementary school with their tap middle school band t-shirt on <laughs> they already are a part of our group right so as much as you they're plus they're selling for you so any kids that haven't signed up yet they'll go to those and say how did you get that tap middle school band shirt well I already signed up and so that kind of helps you recruit as well but yeah any chance you can get to get your swag out there we had string backpacks we had bumper stickers we had decals for their cases we had case tags you name it plus it was a fundraiser so everything that we sold that was our swag we made a little bit of money off for our fundraiser so all right, but you just consider doing more and more and more right now, meaning many opportunities to join. So again, that re-recruiting. So maybe you need to go back and take a look at your, now they were first year students last year, now they're second year students and you need more and you need to go back and get more. It's okay. I would totally go back and re-recruit. And it, you know, it could be you're dealing with, you know, spring, summer, fall times that you can do that in or quarters and semesters. Lisa, I think you you mentioned that depending on what kind of schedule you're on. But give mm -hmm. students a second chance. And it's OK. Maybe if those students, you know, the rest of the class is in their second year and you're going back and recruiting. You know, if you're starting in sixth grade, these students are now in seventh grade. That's all right. Maybe have a beginning class in seventh grade. Figure out a way to do that. And we're actually going to give you some resources that can help you with those students that are maybe coming in as beginners into a second year class. And then do you want to talk about the next two things students Just, you may have lost? You know, if, if you're at a school and only 10 or 20 or 30 percent of the students in that school are in a music program, where are those other 70 percent? Don't hesitate to, to go out and recruit them. And if it's your counseling office that is the one deciding the schedule, tell them, I am willing to take as many students as you can give me and I will deal with whatever skill level because I'm an amazing music teacher and I know I can help those kids get caught up. So my amazing tuba player daughter, right? She started on trumpet. So there's an example of her, you know, adapting to the, the band teacher, adapting the instrumentation. But she also started cello as a senior in high school. And the orchestra teacher didn't blink an eye. She was like, of course you can come play cello. And she worked hard that summer beforehand, self-taught, even with her mom being an orchestra teacher willing to help her out, she self-taught herself and still performed at the final concert, did orchestra the full year. So don't discount those kids who maybe aren't in a music class 
they're still in your school and they can still appreciate music. Yep, totally. Which brings I, you I to just talked to that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean, yeah. seriously, re recruit, recruit the upperclassmen. And as long mm -hmm. as it's, you know, you're providing them with the, the resources to get caught up to self-pace. And we're going to, again, talk about that. But how can they be a part of your program, too? Speaking of. <laughs> So, um, Music Professor is an online video curriculum that can help your students through this entire process. So on the screen, if you don't know who this person is, um, this is Mr. Bowman, an amazing euphonium teacher and professional player. So using the videos in here, your, your students can self-pace their way through a sequential curriculum created by professional players and teachers. And because you, as the teacher, get access to all the videos, you can also use it for recruiting video demonstrations. You can use it in your class classroom to reinforce rehearsal techniques. You can use it for flipped classroom, but a great way to, to give those students the tools that they need to play catch up. Yeah, that's great. Which brings us to the word I don't like, two words I don't like, learning loss. And what I'd like to, us to wrap our head around, talk about paradigm shift and Instead of learning loss, let's talk about reigniting that learning. So maybe this past year it was delayed. It was disrupted. Let's go with those words. But I think it's all about, and I'm sure you've heard this, but I agree with it 110%, meet students where they are right now, right? And then move on from there and accept where they are. And it's okay. It's okay that maybe this class is not the same place your typical class is at this time of year, and it's going to be all right. And it's all a balancing act, in my opinion. It's all about figuring out, you know, how you're going to still teach the fundamentals, but still have fun and the whole remediation part. Anything else, Elisa? Yeah, it's, it's really balancing fun with rigor. Right. Because you yeah. want them to have fun, but you also want it to be rigorous. And we normally have to deal with that. But now we may have to be dealing with a lot of remediation as well. And that's OK. We're teachers. That's we can okay. do it. <laughs> and it's all about, you know, getting back to the basics and still focusing on those fundamentals that students need to have. And there's a session that I do a lot. It's called Hiding the Vegetables. And I'm just going to give you just a little taste of that. But I think it's still true right now. And a lot of the resources from my uh, Hiding the Vegetables session I included in the handout. But it's all about having the students buy into whatever it is you're teaching. OK, even the fundamentals. Why is it that we're doing this? Why are we playing chorales? Why are we playing scales? They have to understand the why and the purpose behind that. And don't allow for boredom. You've, you as the teacher need to change it up so it's not the same thing. So that's like in another balancing where you're balancing the routine of they still need to get all these vegetables every day, but keeping it fresh, right? And making that repetition sometimes what we call fun. Elisa, do you well, want to talk about? Go ahead. Yeah, remember remember that repetition isn't a bad thing. In fact, the more they do it, the more successful they get at it, and the more fun it becomes because of that success. So, and this should go for all of your classroom activities. If you found some things that your students think are really fun, don't hesitate to bring them up again and again. Your students will continue to enjoy it. Yeah, and one of the resources that's in our handout is a fabulous article that Elisa wrote about this very topic which is repetition. So that is in your handout as well. But when I talk about vegetables, those are the fundamentals. Those are the things. And the reason I came up with this title is I thought about as a kid, my mom always made sure I got my vegetables. And I didn't always really like everything, but she found creative ways to make sure I ate them, whether it was on top of a pizza or in a casserole or something like that. And that's kind of what we're doing as teachers. We're trying to hide those vegetables into the fun stuff we're doing every day. So, you know, breathing exercises. We, we always do balloons every day with our students, buzzing exercises. And I'm going to show you a couple of really quick videos to demonstrate how you can do that in a fun way, even with long tones and scales, changing it up every day so it's not the same thing. I will say this, though, the reason I love breathing exercises besides what it does for wind players, with younger students, it really does help them calm down when they're coming into class and get them focused for the day.
But one of the things I wanted to, sh to show you from this slide is how we would do our buzzing exercises with our brass students. And the actual buzzing exercises and the MP3 backgrounds are included in your handout as well. So you will have access to what you're seeing in the videos here. Okay, so you get the idea with that one. And then I have one more I'm gonna show you. I will tell you though, before I show you the second one, that whenever I show these to even college students, they're like, what in the world is this? Oh my gosh, I wanna warm up with these too. So the college students even like them. I, well I even did that students. when I was teaching. I'll, I'll tell you when it's done. <laughs> Cute Calypso feel. So you get the idea with those. So go, Lisa, what were you going to say? Well, when we were doing online band rehearsals, which yes, we did them with my community band too, because I didn't want them to go a year without playing. I actually would add, I, I did everything on Google Slides. So my whole lesson plan or my whole rehearsal plan was on slides and I let them choose. I had like a funk backbeat against a rock backbeat and they would choose and whichever one they voted more for was the one that we did the warm up to. And then maybe the next slide, it was like a jazz backbeat with a rock anthem. The, the, the best thing you can do, turn on a, a drum video with your students. They have so many on YouTube accessible. Yeah, you're, you're totally right about that. And it's even the same thing with long tones. You know, you can do that with long tones. You can do that with scale exercises. Um, so let me talk for a minute about method book. I will just say this, I'm gonna preach this. It does not matter right now what line you're on in the book, who cares? right? Just get your students comfortable making great sounds, great tone quality. I am a big proponent of making sure the fundamentals are sound and not being in a hurry getting through the method book. But I, I preach that even more now because you're meeting students again where they are, right? They may not be in the same place they've been in the past year. So that being said, your beginners are not going to be in the same place this next year. So that may mean backing up a little bit in that method book, and that's okay right? Um, sight reading. So sight reading, I always, I change this up every day how I would do it. We would always spend just a few minutes doing sight reading, whether it's just a new line out of one of our books, or when the students came in, I'd have sight reading folders on the stand with new music we would read, or a different method book on there. We would have class sets of different method books. Find creative ways to get your students to sight read. How do they become better readers? By sight reading every day. That's how. And then the obvious, well, corrals to me is a non-negotiable. We would do corrals every day, whether it be corrals that were actually, you know, music in their binder or something from a method book or a lyrical section of a piece of music that we were playing. And then smart literature selection, which, you know, I have a, an entire presentation on that. Um, but to me, it's all backward design and it's all figuring out where you want your students to be and backing up and figuring out with the teaching of the fundamentals, how you're going to get them there. And I just I think chamber music is an integral part of making sure your students become fabulous musicians. Plus, they enjoy it. Anything, and can I, Lisa? Yeah, yeah, I want to I want to add to this list improvisation which if you give them the right parameters, even kindergartners can do improvisation. Yeah. We used to do um, body beat drum circle kind of stuff. And it's just a matter of pointing to them, to telling them you get four counts or you get eight counts, adapt it according to the skill level of your students, but get them improvising and creating music and they will love you for it. And it's great for them. Totally. 
And then even working on tuning, if you have not used tonal energy with your students, I could not recommend it enough. We started with our beginners from the very beginning. You can't beat a smiley face. You know, when the student, students see the first time, oh my gosh, I'm in tune, I got the green smiley. It's the best way to start students using a tuner. Um, one of the sessions that we had, and you're gonna get information on how to access our Con Summer Institute Connect uh, sessions from this past summer. But one of the sessions we had was with Phil Geiger and Al Albert Vela from Tonal Energy. And they actually did an entire session on all the things you probably didn't even know Tonal, Tonal Energy could do. So I highly recommend checking that one out if you have time and are interested in learning more about that. So Con Summer Institute Connect is our summer workshop that we have in June. And we just wrapped that up with over 90 sessions online this past year. And now you're able to buy that content from our library for only $37. It's over 90 sessions so and crazy. Um, available to you in our handout. I mean, you can't beat that. But, you know, some of the, the sessions Again, we had the entire Martin family, Freddie, Chris, and Michael Martin. Uh, again, Mickey Smith Jr., Paula Kreider, Richard Saucedo, Amanda Drinkwater, holy cow, Michael Sweeney, Robert W. Smith, Sue Hahn, Greg Bim. I could go on and on and on. So check that out. Yeah, and something for everybody there too. We really designed uh, that, that whole event so that it had something for every teacher. Yeah, and even social emotional learning, Dr. Scott Edgar, you name mm -hmm. it, it's there. All right, so now we got to talk about this learning delay and building confidence in our individual players and in our individual progress, which is so important, probably one of the biggest things you're a little stressed about right now. And I think with this, you have to, I call it amp up the fun, okay? We've got to talk about how you're going to get them engaged and wanting to do better, and that's games, fun concerts, chamber ensemble groups, middle school and high school collaborations. One of the things I wanted to tell you about, and the instructions for this are in your handout as well, a really, really fun game that I would do with my beginners, and that's called band baseball. And it's super easy, real quick. All you do is put three chairs at the front of the room. You got first, second, third base, split your class in half, let them come up with a cute team name and then pick what you want them to play, whether it be a line on a book, a scale, an eight, whatever it is. And then if they play it correctly, they go have a seat in first base and you go from there. All the instructions are in it, but every Friday we would do that after their playing test. Oh my gosh, if I would skip a Friday, they'd let me have it. So band baseball is a great way to hear your individual kids play. Besides just doing a playing test, pick other stuff, you know, but it gives them an opportunity to play individually. And then fun concerts. So we would always do a Halloween spectacular concert where the students would dress up in their Halloween costumes. The eighth graders would help me decorate the whole auditorium and the stage, super cute. We would dress up. I may have been Yoda there. The kids thought I was Shrek, but I definitely was Yoda. We invite <laughs> the, the, all the little younger brothers and sisters to come up to the stage. We make little goodie bags of candy to hand out, but oh my gosh, the buy-in was there. OK, and they just they love their music. But I'll be honest with you. Halloween music has some serious <laughs> teaching in there because you're dealing, you know, chromaticism and harmonics, all kinds of tools you can use for teaching. And, so and that all comes to that's all, yeah. all student centered learning is what you're doing there. Right. You pick the music that the students might recognize that they'll enjoy. That's the stuff they will eat up and play. And you don't have to pull teeth to get them to practice because they love it. Absolutely. And this this particular concert we did with the high school band showed up as a surprise at the end. The kids didn't know it was happening. The parents went nuts. Kids are crying. And we ended with the fight song. It was, you know, it was awesome. awesome. But it's all ways that you can build that bridge, right? Building that bridge from middle school to high school and engaging the two programs together. Having, I said, collaborations earlier high school and middle school concerts together at eighth grade night where they go over to the football game. We did with our, our chamber ensembles an ugly sweater holiday concert where they all wore, you know, cute little ugly sweaters. We'd go around to the elementary schools. And then Elisa, you want to take it from here? Yeah, I, I just want to point out this through line of traditions, right? 
traditions are what build the culture and it's part of that culture that they want to be in. So I wanted to throw some things out here for our elementary choir teacher, things that have totally worked for me and can be d done both on in the classroom or hybrid or online. So like creating your own sing-along slides, again, getting students who may be a little uncomfortable singing out, anything you can do to get them to sing and sing along with each other. Singing into microphones was always fun. I'd even go to the dollar store and get like the little plastic microphones and even my middle school boys loved those and often broke them. So get like five. <laughs> um, we would do karaoke time and they had the option of singing by themselves or with others or with a sing-along video. Again, the rap battles, literally any text you throw on a sweet backbeat, they are gonna love it. Demonstrate it, they can be rapping in like five seconds. Um, my elementary kids loved Just Dance. That was always the reward after they did a, a really great um, rehearsal or really great class time, or if I needed to fill in some extra time, or at the end of the week, even again, the middle schoolers loved that. When I started a middle school choir and ukulele ensemble, I asked them what their favorite songs were. Were some inappropriate for a private Catholic school? Absolutely. But there were also a lot that I was like, yeah, actually we can do that. There's a radio cut of that and it's only three chords. It might take a little more research on your part, but if you can get their buy-in by playing songs that they recognize and enjoy, you will absolutely get them wrapped around your finger. And then you can start adding songs that maybe they don't recognize because they've got that buy-in with you. Incorporate instruments with your choir and elementary kids. They will absolutely love it. They'll probably fight over it. So have a plan ahead of time. Um, I used to, every time we'd add a new song to our, our singing list, I would add it into a cup for that grade level. And so if I needed, again, a reward time, an end of class time, getting them to choose a song out of the cup. And was it repetition? Yes, and review, absolutely. But because they knew it and loved it, it, it was a total buy-in. And then theming your program. So the same thing that Erin was just talking about with a spectacular thing. I've done the time machine, silly songs, world tour. We did a whole, a whole Disney thing. And all of those were opportunities for me to cross curricularly teach as well, talk about music history, talk about connections with other cultures. And the, the parents loved it. That time machine one, I still get parents coming up to me like, oh, do you remember that program? And because at the end, um, we had the, I built the culture of at the end of any elementary school program we did and everybody dance where every participant in the program, the entire school did a dance together at the end of the program. And at that time machine ones, the parents actually sang along. It was, That's awesome. it was amazing. They loved it. So the, on our Halloween spectacular, the one that I couldn't take off after the first time was Thriller. So Thriller had to be on there every time with the smoke machine. If we didn't do it, you know, with we had a little vamp where the kids did the dance. Same deal. I once can't did go a, back. I did a confetti cannon once at the yeah. end of a performance. <laughs> and of course, everybody was like, are you going to do the confetti cannon yeah, again? And you I can't like, go back. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot. Um, but, but really, talking about individual development, if you can teach them to love it at school, they will do it at home. I'm sure that you've heard of, you know, not just the, the individual practice of students who are in your hallways or in your practice rooms, but I would get elementary school parents saying, you know, that, that kid, loves this song and they love singing music. In fact, I was conducting a community band rehearsal in a park because COVID and um, there were some families playing in the park. And as soon as the rehearsal was over, three of my former students ran up to me and the littlest one was like, Miss Jones, do you remember me? And I was like, of course, which I did, right? And, <laughs> and, and she, actually started singing for me a song that I had taught her three years uh, previous because she'd never stopped singing it that whole time. That's cute. That was adorable. <laughs>
So obviously if they love it, give them the tools to progress on their own because if it's too challenging for them or they don't have the resources, they'll just stop. They'll hit that, that educational barrier where it's too hard and they'll freeze, right? Or they'll run away from it. So the more you can give them these tools to progress on their own at home, the better they will be able to do it. So we're gonna pop back to Music Professor, that series of video resources that you can, um, not only as a teacher, you can track their individual progress, you can see what they've been watching, you can see how much of it that they've watched, all from trusted teachers, so no more searching through YouTube to find, well, I need one on euphonium tone quality. Like, that's all in there, and you don't have to be searching for it. It's all curated, and it's modular, so you can actually line it up with any method book that you're using. It's perfect for self-paced learning, right? My daughter who picked up cello, how much more helpful would it have been for her to have an on-screen cello teacher that she could rewind, she could pause, and has that professional demonstration. It's also great for differentiated learning. You're gonna have students who are a little more uh, skilled than other students or a little more practiced, and this gives them an opportunity too to find their own skill level and match it and will reinforce your rehearsal stuff. It's great for flipped classroom. You can give them the assignments. Hey everybody, tomorrow we're gonna to be talking about Concert F. So here is the video to go watch Concert F. And when you come back tomorrow, I'm gonna to check and make sure that you're, you're all. So you're getting your rehearsal time back as well. And then with Music Professor, they you can, add multiple instruments to the student's dashboard so they can play tuba and trombone or French horn and trumpet or clarinet and I don't know, what what else do clarinet players play? Saxophone? Saxophone. Oboe. Everybody should play oboe and bassoon. Oh. Let's just let's just throw that out there, right? So I'm, I know how frustrating it can be when you're trying to fix your instrumentation too because you've got 32 flutes and, and no oboes or bassoons, and you're like, well, I'd love to play this song, but uh, there's that oboe solo. It's easier for you to just send them home with this as a resource to learn that secondary instrument, and then it, you become the coach who just checks in on their progress and learning instead of the one who's actually hand-holding them and taking up your rehearsal time to do so. And then uh, this is also a brand new feature in Music Professor, and it's this social media style board where you can, you probably, this looks like Google Classroom too. It's just a place where you can communicate with your students, drop awesome resources, you can do class assignments, you can do engagement, and it's not on social media. And you can use, I think your own Google Classroom logins to log into Music Professor 2. So they can log in, find that community portal, that's what this is called, and then go right into the videos and practice exactly what you guide them to do. Again, making you the coach and giving them the self-efficacy to learn at their own pace. I love that. Yeah, and even incorporating your, your high school students into your middle school program and the individual progress as well by setting up a mentorship program. We did this and I was inspired by all the Japanese DVDs that I watched and how the older students mentor and teach the younger students. I was like, well, you know, I could do that to some level with my own students and teaching at a Title I school. Most of my students were not able to afford taking private lessons. So I wanted to create some way that they could still get some individual instruction from our own students. So we would use our advanced students that are in the top high school band, and they would do group lessons with our younger beginner students, which was just a ton of fun and another great way to engage the high school and middle school programs and create that bridge. Our chamber ensembles did everything together. That picture you see above there is half middle school students and half high school students. Um, we would also have, whenever we would have after school sectionals, the high school students come over and sit in and play along with them in the sectionals. They love to do that. You know how high school kids are. They come, they want to come back over to the middle school and they always say, man, this band room seemed bigger when I was here. <laughs> they always say that when they walk in, but it was great to have them back the younger students love to have them sit there beside them. So the side-by-sides, I think, are, are super effective. And, and that's how you recruit the next generation of music teachers. We need more music teachers 
like you. Which brings us to this, which is your number one resource, because we're giving you a ton of resources in the handout. Of course, Aaron and I could go on about all of this for the next three hours, but we don't have that kind of time today. So tap into those resources, and the number one resource is each other. And that's why I, I created this group. Um, it's on Facebook. You're welcome. Uh, it's the Music Educators Creating Online Learning. And even though we use that term online learning in there, it is an incredibly supportive group for whatever your teaching needs are. And with more than 38, 40, 48,000 members, it's incredibly active. And we have a huge um, body of moderators from all different backgrounds, all different teaching levels, all different teaching topics. So it's a really well moderated group as well. So reach out to each other. That's what you're here doing today with professional development. You are the number one resource for each other. So we're going to bring it back full circle here. And why do students stay? Again, it's the same thing we talked about at the very beginning of why do they join? Because it's a social place, a sense of belonging, and they want to be part of something that is successful. It's a family, community, the fun part of things. And you take the time to care and convince them to stay in your program. It all comes back to you. And they stay because of you. And they want to run down to that choir room. They want to run down to that orchestra and band room. And it's because you care and you're taking the time to make those connections. That is the key. And I know we've given you so much information today and there's even more in the handout. But we just want to wish you the very, very best school year. You've got this. It's going to be fantastic. We're here for you. If you have any other questions, please, please don't hesitate to reach out. But again, remember your why, right, Elisa? Remember yeah. why we do this. Every time you're having a bad day, every time you're thinking, why am I doing this? Remember, this is why. This is why. And I love this quote, just to finish it out from Tim. It's so true. Students don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. He says that all the time. And just always say that back in your mind. It's all about the, making those connections and caring. So again, please don't hesitate to reach out. We would love to thank Louisiana MEA, Brett Babineau for the invitation, and of course, Con Selmer for so for sponsoring our appearance here. Again, have a wonderful school year. Anything, Elisa, from you to sign off? Nope, just keep the faith and keep teaching on. Thank you.